When 17th century Dutch sailors were exploring the Western Australian coast, they reported sighting a lost civilization. They were looking through the telescopes, and what they saw looked like the remains of a lost city. They couldn't get ashore because the coastline was too rugged, so they went away believing they'd found a lost civilization. What they'd found, in fact, was made by nature. These limestone columns here are now called the pinnacles. These are only some of the natural wonders we're going to show you as we explore Western Australia's outback coast. Travel with us along the outback coast and take in Western Australia's famous wildflowers. We walk spectacular gorges, see rugged coastlines and shipwrecks, sail blue waters, feed dolphins, dive for pearls, chase sharks in a helicopter, fly over steep point and visit the most westerly point in Australia, see wildlife up close, get flooded in at Mount Augustus and find out where the outback meets the sea. Nambung National Park is 250 kilometres north of Perth. And before we venture north, we're exploring the amazing Pinnacles Desert, the most popular area in the 17,000 hectare park. It's easy to understand how sailors at sea could have mistaken these golden columns for crumbling ruins of an ancient city. Distance would have made them look larger than their real height of up to five metres. There are about 150,000 limestone columns and they're estimated to be about 30,000 years old. These pinnacles come in all shapes and sizes. Fat, tall, skinny, look at this one here. That definitely does look like some sort of castle, that one. The pinnacles are gradually eroding away. As you can see here on the ground, all these little tiny flakes that have actually dropped off. So the limestones are gradually just fretting away. I suppose in many, many millions of years, they'll get smaller and smaller and disappear. The wind and erosion that created the pinnacles is gradually eating them away, particularly on the exposed hill areas. These uncanny formations were created by water interacting with sand, quartz and limestone. And what we see today are the eroded remnants of a once thick limestone bed beneath the golden sands. Probably the best time to view the pinnacles is either sunrise or sunset, and the sun is setting now. The Pinnacles Desert has to be one of Australia's most fascinating landscapes, day or evening. Western Australia is known as a wildflower state, and for good reason. As we're driving north, we just see beds of wildflowers everywhere. In fact, beside the road, it looks as if they've been planted out like a garden. Some tracks in the area are completely covered in yellow paper daisies. A walk through the surrounding countryside reveals millions of flowers carpeting the entire landscape. It's almost impossible to believe they just grow like this each year, creating a rainbow of colours in all directions. We're lucky, we're told this is the best season for about six years. It's great to see the unusual kangaroo paw in the wild. This is Western Australia's floral emblem. At Coombardale we drop in to see the Western Wildflower Farm run by Rhonda and Arthur Tonkin. Farming Australia's native wildflowers is becoming a viable alternative to regular farming. The Tonkins plant out about 8,000 banksia plants on the sand plains of their farm each year. It's against the law to pick wildflowers, but here it's okay. The Tonkins have special permits to grow and harvest the flowers. Margie has a passion for flowers and eagerly helps Arthur collect a bunch of banksias. Back at the processing area, we meet Rhonda Tonkin. Rhonda, what happens to the banksias now? They'll be brought in here and dried, and then we'll be exporting them to Italy. We're looking for one million stems to go there, and a lot of the banksia goes into Europe, and it's uh, sought after and a very special flower for bouquet work there. Banksia is regarded very highly. The export of dried flowers is a really uh, good business and excellent for Australia to have our product going overseas and sought after as it is. In 1977, Rhonda started this wildflower business as a hobby, and now it's a great success. So if you want some wildflowers, pick them here, from Rhonda's collection, not in the bush. Wildflowers are a huge drawcard to tourists to Western Australia. 
and in the months of August and November, you'll find flower enthusiasts travelling what's known as the Wildflower Way, which passes through the wildflower town of Malawa. Western Australia's wildflowers come in all shapes and colours, but the most amazing sight you can imagine is a spectacle of billions of paper daisies covering thousands of hectares. It's a dazzling sight and something that stays in your memory forever. Everlasting paper daisies come in a variety of colours, including white, which just looks for all the world like fields of cotton balls swaying in the breeze. Other flowers, like the delicate cat's paw, are often hidden under bushes and more difficult to see. We have to walk through the countryside to find the more isolated flower gems. The wildflowers of the West have intrigued visitors for hundreds of years. Early navigators and explorers took seeds and specimens back to Europe before Australia was settled. With picture postcard scenes everywhere, it's a challenge to find an elusive flower. This unusual flat plant here is known as a wreath plant, or Stockman's wreath. It's not found in very many parts of Western Australia, just around the townships of Mullawa and Pinda. It's quite rare in fact. This is just a small little daisy that's growing out in the middle of it that's not part of the plant. It does look like a wreath, doesn't it? The wreath plant is one of Western Australia's most striking wildflowers, and it is a bit difficult to find. It grows best in disturbed areas, such as this old gravel pit. It certainly is a very memorable flower. The Northwest Coastal Highway takes us through a primrose landscape as we head north to explore Calbarry's amazing gorges. Our next stop is the small seaside town of Calbarry. With a population of 1500, Calbarry is situated at the mouth of the Murchison River. It's an ideal place to stay whilst exploring the surrounding Calbarry National Park. The pelicans are friendly and the scenery is great. From the small township of Calbarry, we're going to explore some more natural wonders, starting along the spectacular coastline. The river mouth is a good place to start, where you can fish, watch the wild ocean, or get right into it at Jake's Corner, a world-renowned surfing spot with great left-handers. I'm not sure if that's the surfers or the waves. It looks pretty good to us, but the surfer's dog has seen it all before. Whether you're catching them or copping them, the waves at Calbarry are pretty awesome. Whereas Witakara Creek is not known for its waves, this picturesque spot has a direct link with Australia's past. This can and plaque at the mouth of Witakara Creek marks the place where they believe the first white settlers actually landed in Australia. That was back in 1629. They were actually shipwreck survivors from the Batavia and they were mutineers and the captain of the Batavia put them ashore here to fend for themselves. No one knows whether they survived or what happened to them, but they built this can here to mark this spot. The Batavia Mutiny claimed around 200 lives, and the mutineers were executed. But Commander Pelsart gave the two youngest murderers a last chance because of their age. If they survived and it could be proved, it would rewrite Australia's history books. The Dutch could claim to be the founding colony. Today, exploring the rugged coastline is much easier and a rewarding pastime. All these coloured bands of rock that you see here in Calbarry National Park are known as Tumble Gooder Sandstone. And I'm not joking, that's what they're really called, Tumble Gooder Sandstone. And they were laid down about 400 million years ago when this area here was a mountain and the sea was another 140 kilometres out west. And over the years they've just gradually eroded down and turned into spectacular scenery like we see today. The ocean waves have eroded the sandstone to create weird shapes like the aptly named Mushroom Rock. The shape is due to eroding of a softer layer underneath, leaving the upper harder sediments to form a cap on the mushroom. To get the most out of our visit, it's necessary to leave the four-wheel drive and take short walks that lead to fascinating places. These unusual tube formations in the sandstone were created by an ancient sandworm called Scolothos. The worms lived 400 million years ago and dug vertical burrows. As sediments were layered down, the worm extended its burrow upward, filling in behind with sand. This compacted sand was more resistant to weathering, creating the unusual tube effect that looks like drizzled icing on a cake. The layering of weathered sandstone cliffs are most obvious at Pot Alley, named by early cray fishermen who lost lots of cray pots due to water depth and rough seas. 
A little further down the coast, the cliffs get more rugged and rise to heights of 100 metres and more. This sea stack is called Island Rock, a classical feature of this type of weathered coastline. This sea arch is known as Natural Bridge and it's probably the most photographed feature on the coastline. Looking at the power of the sea, it makes us wonder if the two mutineers survived in this harsh environment, where people come today by choice to experience a remarkable Calvary coast. About 50 kilometres inland is the Loop, a huge 8 kilometre loop in the Murchison River. We're going to explore the Loop and look at how some of this fascinating area was created. Next to the river at the bottom of the loop here, you can see these ripples in the stone. They're quite solid. They were created millions of years ago when this was a mud flat, and the waters caused these ripples to sit there. Then it's set like concrete over the years. And not far away, there's more unusual marks in the rock. These funny little tracks in the rock here were actually made millions of years ago by an ancient form of centipede. They look a little bit like tyre tracks, only miniature. Geologists say this section of the Australian coast was lifted about 300 metres above sea level by an upheaval 150 million years ago. It's estimated it would have taken a couple of million years for the wind and waters of the Murchison River to carve this deep canyon in the colourful soft sandstone. This overhanging ledge cave is part of the way around the loop and it's an excellent example of tumbled gutta sandstone. You can see the banded colours running through it. Each metre in depth of sandstone represents about 70,000 years of formation and the soft sandstone has been weather-worn over another couple of million years to create this large overhanging cave with its rainbow colours. We're back at the top of the sandstone ridge overlooking the loop and the view downstream is breathtaking. Nature's window attracts us like it does every other visitor to the park and we must take a photo of course. The 186,000 hectare park is home to a variety of reptiles, such as this beautifully patterned monitor lizard. Apart from the wonderful views, there are a huge variety of flowers to seek out. Small orchids hide under bushes, and the brazen colours of the bottle brush and daisies attract our attention in this ancient landscape. The view from the Zed Bend lookout is absolutely fantastic and at the moment there's a lot of water running down there, apparently the most I've had for a long long time. It's a view not to be missed. The Zed Bend is different to the loop in shape and geological age. The rock strata here is about a million years younger and further upstream we come to Hawk's Head, a prominent overhanging rock that from certain angles looks like a hawk's head. From here we get another view of the mighty Murchison River that has its source 400 kilometres inland near Mika Thara. It's definitely one of Western Australia's great rivers. Calvary National Park certainly has a lot to offer the traveller along the outback coast. 200 kilometres north of Calvary brings us to the World Heritage listed Shark Bay area that's crammed with natural wonders. This is a crunchy beach, in fact it's a shell beach. There are absolutely billions and billions of tiny shells here and it's taken about 4,000 years for these shells to build up here and they're about 5 metres deep and still piling up. This unique beach is made up entirely of small shells. The high salinity of the water here means there are a few predators to eat this small burrowing cockle. And when the shellfish die, they form a massive underwater bed of white shells. The gate at Hamlin Pool Telegraph Station gives us a hint of what's to be seen here. Not far from the shell beach you can find this shell block quarry. These are shells here have been compacted underneath the ocean, joined together with calcium, and now they've formed into a solid bank which you can cut up with a saw and make blocks to build buildings with. Very light as you can see here, also very good for insulation. They only used it these days for actually restoring some of the old buildings that were built back in the old days when that was the only building material they had in the area. 
This solid bank of shells are a compacted form of the burrowing cockles that make up the shell beach. These blocks are so light you can pick one up this size, pretending you're Superman. Try doing that with a concrete block. And just nearby you can see life on Earth as it was three and a half billion years ago. We're at Hamlin Pool and what we're looking at here from this boardwalk are called stromatolites. They're very, very ancient, very, very rare and very inactive. At least that's how it looks from here. In fact, there are billions of microscopic organisms hard at work building these underwater stromatolites. Up to 3,000 million individual organisms live in each square metre. Too small to see, except with a microscope, they resemble the oldest forms of life on Earth and they live here because the shallow water has a very high salt content. These are living fossils, and all I can say about that is, I hope I never come back as a stromatolite. Our next stop is Denham, the only town in the Shark Bay area, where we get to see an example of shell brick construction at the old Perla restaurant. This area has many historic connections with the sea. First came Dutch navigators and explorers. In the late 1800s, Denham became a thriving community, centred around the pearling industry. The old pearling lugger on the waterfront is retired now, but a new generation of pearl farmers with modern equipment are still diving for pearl shells. Right. Yeah. We're going out with Jeff and Rob from the Blue Lagoon Pearl Farm. Well, here we are, we're just about to go down and uh, get the wild shell from the bottom. Uh, we'll yeah, get about a couple of hundred shell ready for seeding. The live shells that Rob is collecting grow wild in the waters of Shark Bay and this is a once a week job. The divers work three hours gathering, then take a break before doing another three hour stint. And on a good day, they can collect a thousand shells. Okay, Rob, now what are these for? These are the Albina pearl shell, Mike. And uh, they're uh, what we use mainly on the farm here with our black lip shell as well. Our catch goes straight back to the floating pontoon and workshop that's anchored in Redcliffe Bay. Here the shells are cleaned and prepared for seeding. Jeff performs a delicate task of cutting a small incision inside the body of the living mollusk in preparation for inserting a special round piece of oyster shell into the hole. This nuclei will irritate the host inside the shell and it will coat the nuclei with a substance called nacre, turning this round irritant into a beautiful round cultured pearl. In nature, a piece of sand can be the beginnings of a beautiful pearl. The shells are now suspended in special hangars, which are turned regularly for three months, before being put out into deeper water. Over here we have our long lines. Now uh, this is where our shell actually hang uh, for a, their time while we actually wait, wait for the pearls to grow. Uh, they'll spend anywhere from one to two years to make our halves and our beautiful three-quarter pearls. The pearl shells must be cleaned in this special machine once a month. This goes on for up to five years. It's the messy and tedious side of the business that tourists to the Blue Lagoon Pearl Farm don't see. This is the first and only farm in the world to ever produce a commercial crop of three-quarter pearls and we're pretty darn proud of ourselves at that too. It's all Australian owned and all Australian technicians. And because we are the first, we won't be showing you how at that one. There's your beautiful three-quarter pearl. This table of half and three quarter pearls, along with the full natural pearls, are worth $45,000. The necklace alone is $20,000, and sorry Margie, you can't keep it. We're at a very special beach in Western Australia, this is called Monkey Mire, and here people come to see dolphins, and in fact it's the only place in the world you can actually go down and hand feed wild dolphins. I'm taking the underwater camera to see if I can get some shots of them underneath the water. Early morning is the best time to get here, because as soon as a dolphin appears, people seem to come from nowhere, eager to meet the dolphins. We have special permission to film underwater from Western Australia's Department of Conservation and Land Management. This young bottlenose dolphin is called Piccolo, and has caught a fish. I can't believe our luck getting film of Piccolo having fun with his catch. He's showing off in front of the crowd, just like any youngster would. Wild dolphins have been coming into this beach to interact with humans since the 1960s and it's now a world famous occurrence.
Rangers are on hand to help and advise visitors and ensure the dolphins are well treated. And in case you were wondering, this is how the crowd looks to a dolphin. A few eager visitors are selected to hand feed the dolphins. They're only fed regulated small amounts so they don't become dependent on handouts. And this is a magic moment for me. After filming Piccolo, he voluntarily comes over and nudges my leg. It's a special experience. Another great experience is to take a sail around the waters of Shark Bay. Leaving from the Dolphin Beach, we get a different perspective of the area. And we even have a dolphin escort out into the bay. This 60 foot sailing cat is the ideal way to relax and experience the area. There's also a possibility of seeing a mermaid, or at least what early sailors thought was a mermaid. It is possible that some dugong may be sneaking onto this bank with the tide. The dugong, or sea pig, grazes on the seagrass beds that cover a thousand square kilometres of the shallow waters of Shark Bay. Dugongs by nature are timid mammals, and it's a rare privilege to see even a glimpse of them. <laughs> Today we're lucky, and ahead is a mother and calf slowly swimming in the shallow water. In most places in the world, dugong have been hunted to extinction. Their meat is much sought after and tastes a bit like pork. It's been estimated that around 10,000 dugongs live safely in this World Heritage Protected Area, a unique natural wonder that's here for future generations to see. For over 100 years, Peron Peninsula was a sheep station. Today it's a national park. We're just entering the four-wheel drive section of the Francois Peron National Park. Before you go any further, they suggest you deflate your tyres a little bit, put your vehicle in four-wheel drive, and this helps protect the track. Peron Peninsula juts north into the centre of Shark Bay. It's predominantly red sandy plains with flat, stark clay pans dotted throughout. When you're driving through the National Park, it pays to keep an eye out for dangerous beriders. Now it's not some Mexican takeaway food, in fact it's a gypsum clay pan which has a very thin crust on the surface and below it is a boggy mire. You drive under that with your vehicle and goodbye four wheel drive. The beriders were landlocked saline lakes when sea levels were much higher. Mostly red sand, this 40,000 hectare park supports a large variety of wildflowers, including this succulent pig face growing in desert conditions. We're on the western side of Cape Peron, and I just feel like I've walked across the Simpson Desert or something like that with these red sand hills. And this is where the outback meets the sea. The red sand hills here run down to the beach and the water level here. Amazing stuff. This is where the outback coast name comes from, where this red sand runs down to the beach. And what a fantastic panorama it makes. It's so different to any other seascape I've ever seen. I just love it. We're about to take a helicopter flight over Shark Bay and some of the surrounding area here and along the way we're going to find out why it's called Shark Bay. We're leaving from Monkey Mire and our pilot has promised we will see a variety of landscapes and sea life from the air. Almost straight away we spot a lone dugong basking in the sun. And two huge rays with a youngster glide along gracefully in the shallows. And of course we expected to see dolphins. But we were not expecting anything like this. What at first appears to be a lot of fish in the shallow bay turns out to be an amazing number of sharks. And amongst them, a couple of stingrays. Almost every bay we fly over is alive with sharks. There's a variety of sharks, including bronze whalers and reef sharks. Some of these sharks are two to three metres in length. When Dutch navigator William Dampier visited here in 1699, he noted that the sea fish he saw here were chiefly sharks. And they were in abundance, so he named the place Shark Bay. And don't believe anyone that tells you sharks don't go into shallow water. This area is only knee deep. It really is an amazing sight. 
Now we're flying west over islands, huge bays, giant sand dunes and heavily scrubbed sand ridges to reach the coastline and the stunning Zeitdorp cliffs. It takes our breath away as our pilot skims across the edge to follow the giant limestone cliffs. The thunder of the Indian Ocean pounding relentlessly into the base of the cliffs is awesome. If we came down in the water here, there would certainly be no way we could get ashore. The cliffs head north along the peninsula, the steep point in the distance. The Zeitdorp cliffs reach heights of 170 metres and stretch south without a break almost to Kalbarri, 200 kilometres away. A formidable coastline that takes its name from the Zeitdorp, a Dutch merchant ship that was wrecked on these cliffs in 1712 with 250 people aboard. There is evidence of survivors, but their fate still remains a mystery today. Shark Bay is described as one of the most fascinating places on Earth, and it's certainly living up to its reputation. Seeing Steep Point from the air makes us doubly keen to drive there. It's about 200 kilometres from Denham over rough tracks. Well, the track to Steep Point is not exactly straight, as you can see. But so far it's not too bad, just a bit bumpy, slow going, but we haven't had to use four-wheel drive so far. Steep Point is only accessible by four-wheel drive. It's on Kararang Station and they collect an entry fee. The track is very narrow in many areas and the soft sand hills can be a challenge in dry weather. This is known as Thunder Bay and there's some big blowholes here. And the reason it's called Thunder Bay is the noise they actually make when the blowholes are working just like a steam train. This hole through the limestone is big enough to swallow a car. So you must watch your step, the place is riddled with holes. We're now taking the sand track to the east of the peninsula and after stopping to remove the stumpy tailed lizard from the track we take to the beach at Shelter Bay. Then more rough sand tracks are leading us to the Steep Point Automatic Lighthouse. Across South Passage is Dirk Hartog Island, named after the Dutch sea captain who left an inscribed pewter plate to mark the landing of the first European in Western Australia. That was back in 1616. Well this is the furthest west you can go without going into the ocean. It's known as Steep Point, the most westerly point of the Australian mainland. Last time I was here was in 1966, when I led an expedition of five across Australia to join up the westerly point to the easterly point, right through the centre. No one had done it before. We set out with two old Land Rovers and completed that task in six months. They haven't been back here since. It's quite emotional actually standing here, thinking back on those days and what happened on that trip. There was no track out to Steep Point in 1966. We blazed our own trail to become the first to drive out here. Now, Steep Point is visited by hundreds of fishermen and four-wheel drive enthusiasts that revel in its raw beauty. On the eastern side of Steep Point, there's a wonderful little bay and you're allowed to camp right on the beach. It's really magic. To get a real feel of the outback, we're leaving the coast and we're heading east, inland. And once again we're driving through a landscape of colours. As far as you can see, you can see these tiny pink paper daisies. After rain, this red sand country comes alive with a variety of wildflowers that are dazzling to the eye. But we never get tired of the spectacle. This little fellow looks worse than he really is. He's called Moloch Horridus, or a thorny devil. They're quite rare, and he's uh, an anteater, so he's quite harmless. Look at him. Thorns all over him, so you can see how he got the name Thorny Devil. It's only the second one I've ever seen in the wild. Over here in Western Australia, apparently they're a bit more common than they are in the centre. It's time to leave this mechanical looking lizard and continue east, where we stop for a break at the historic old pub at Gascoigne Junction, 164 kilometres from the coast. The Gascoigne River is usually a dry 300 kilometre long bed of sand, but recent rains here and upstream have given us a rare water crossing.
G'day Trevor, that's Mike here, just calling to make you feel a bit envious. Yeah, guess where we are? And we're at the world's biggest rock. No, no, that's not Ayers Rock, it's uh, Mount Augustus in Western Australia. Twice as big as Ayers Rock, in fact. Okay, I'll call you again later, just to call in to let you know how we're going, everybody's okay? Okay, mate. Bye. This is a good idea to have when you're away on a trip like this, particularly in remote areas. It's a satellite phone. You can get out anywhere. And uh, if you have a breakdown or some sort of injury, you can call up for help on this. Works really well. Mount Augustus National Park is 500 kilometres inland, and we're staying in cabins at Mount Augustus Station Outback Resort. We've arrived in time for a friendly Aussie barbecue at this low-key resort, operated by Mick and Julie Peckham. It's morning and we wait to a glorious sunrise on Mount Augustus. And during the night, it bucketed down rain and all the roads in the area are closed by floodwaters. At Mount Augustus Station, there's still work to be done, floods or not. It's the annual weaning time and the young calves have to be fed. The calves are taken from their mothers to be weaned over a two week period after which they'll be marked and released into the breeding herd. The white cockatoos also look forward to this time of the year, when there's an easy meal to be had. I come from Grenfell. Are No, it's nice over here. Dot and Don Hammerquist own and manage the cattle station. Mount Augustus station itself was originally settled as a cattle station back in the 18th century. Uh, this property, Mount Augustus station itself, is a million acres and uh, we also own the adjacent place, Dooley Down station, approximately 300,000 acres. So I'd say it'll be among the largest of the properties in this Gascoigne region. We, uh, we basically are breeding short on cattle here, which at the, at the time satisfies the Middle East market. It's now time for the weaners to be driven out to fend for themselves. These young calves are moved into a separate paddock from their mothers, so they will now mix with the breeding herd. This is just one day in the life of a cattle station. Don takes us up for a ride in his aircraft so we can get a look at the country from the air. The resort and station areas look dry, but it's soon obvious that all the main roads and tracks into Mount Augustus are cut by water. We look like being here for a few days. The Lyons River is running a banker and the surrounding country is very wet. Silver streams of water on Mount Augustus emphasise the rock is not very porous and it should be very spectacular when we can get around it on the ground. Mount Augustus is the world's biggest rock but because it's covered with vegetation it looks less stark than Ayers Rock. Uluru is a monolith, a single block of stone. Mount Augustus is a monocline the result of sand and granite being uplifted and folded. It's not only twice as big as Uluru, it's three times older. As we return to land, Don points out Cattle Pool. This picturesque billabong in the Lions River is usually a clear pool and a favourite picnic spot. But today it's a flowing river of orange coloured water, making it even more impressive. The 49 kilometre track around Mount Augustus has just been opened so it's time to explore the Magic Mountain. Kotka Gorge on the northern side is a great place to start. Over the past couple of days we've had about 60 millimetres of rain which has closed all the roads in the area but it has one advantage, it's made all the creeks and streams flow and this little gorge here is absolutely magic. Tadpoles can be seen in the crystal clear pools and the water will flow here for many weeks to come. Higher up the gorge we get a better idea of the size of Mount Augustus. In 1858, explorer Francis Gregory discovered Mount Augustus and was the first European to climb to the top. This area here is called Flintstone 
We're going to walk up here because there's a big rock that has some Aboriginal carvings underneath it. It's above the water there. Aboriginal tribes were here thousands of years before Gregory came along and their distinctive marks etched into stone can be found in many locations around the rock. Flintstone rock would have been very difficult to work on. The southeast corner of Mount Augustus has more galleries of rock art. A lot of the walks around here end up with something really interesting, like this little cave here with these rock engravings in it. Aboriginal mythology says that in the beginning of time, these rocks were soft and a dreaming spirit did these engravings with his finger. Their meanings are lost in time and we can only marvel at their age and make guesses at what the markings represent. These galleries of stone give Mount Augustus a sense of magic and mystery that will linger on well after our visit to this, the biggest rock in the world. It sits 717 metres above the surrounding plain and covers an astonishing 4,795 hectares. That's big. After visiting the Big Rock, we're travelling 75 kilometres north of Carnarvon to see the Big King waves that make the Quabba blowholes so impressive. This reminds us that the outback coast can also be a dangerous coast. And another 30 kilometres north brings us to more evidence of the power of nature and the sea. We've just driven down from the cliff top to have a look at the wreck of the Korean Star. It was washed ashore here in 1988 by Cyclone Herbie. And it's now scattered all along the rocks here, or rusting away here, eventually it'll just disappear into the sea. It's no wonder this part of the Outback Coast was also called the Shipwreck Coast. Just look at that rugged coastline there. 300 kilometres north of Carnarvon, a jagged piece of land just out of the Western Australian coastline. It's called Cape Range Peninsula. This is part of the Cape Range National Park. It looks a bit like a miniature Grand Canyon. It's all limestone here and totally different to what we've seen along the coast so far. This area is Charles Knife Gorge. The deeply eroded canyons of Cape Range were under the sea 10 million years ago. They were eventually forced up as the Earth's crust crumbled to create a backbone of limestone along the Cape. We can drive along the bottom of Shothole Canyon with its colourful eroded mesas, giving it a distinct Wild West look. The area is also home to the all-red Sturt Desert Peak. As far north as we can go is Blaming Head Lighthouse, at the tip of Northwest Cape. We're now heading south on the western side of the range and back into the National Park to visit Yardi Creek, a must-do experience with Neil and Rhonda McGregor. The gorge here at Yardi Creek was formed by water that raced down off the top of the range and picked up rocks and ripped out the limestone and formed the gorge. Yardi Creek has quite a few different species of bird that breed on the walls here. We have reef herons. They come in to utilise this area. They like to nest mainly behind the figs on the walls. That way they get a bit of shade and also get cover. Corellas come in here because we have no big trees. Our trees here are quite small so they utilise the gorge walls where there's holes and ledges and they lay their eggs on those. The fairy martins are in a panic about this lizard that seems to defy gravity as it searches for nests with its favourite food, eggs and babies. Now just up in the cave we have just here on the wall you can see the little western black-footed rock wallaby. These guys utilise the caves, large cracks on the walls here. They use them for protection, also uh, not just from weather conditions but also from feral animals. Their biggest predator is the fox and feral cat. A very wet young ring-necked parrot just manages to save itself from the water as we reach the end of the navigable part of Yardi Creek Gorge. It's time to leave this little pocket of paradise to the wild inhabitants, 
so we can explore the Ningaloo Marine Park and its beaches. Turquoise Bay is one of the best on the peninsula. This unusual creature here is a male elephant seal. They're not normally found this far north and he's not real happy when you get close to him. Southern elephant seals feed on squid and fish, but they can also crush and eat sea turtles with their powerful jaws. Their name comes from the prominent trunk-like proboscis, which acts as a resonator to produce large growling roars. It's telling us to keep our distance, and that's a good idea because they can move very quickly if they get agitated. We've left the elephant seal to bask in the sun, and we're checking out the waters of Turquoise Bay. You can enjoy Ningaloo Reef without being a diver. Just need to put on a mask and flippers, snorkel, take your underwater camera down, have a look at some of the natural wonders here. Ningaloo Marine Park stretches along 260 kilometres of coastline and it's very popular because of its accessibility. A reef only a few hundred metres off the beach makes snorkeling here very easy and the variety of fish to be seen in the small area is astounding. Maybe it's because this area is in a sanctuary zone with no fishing permitted. As well as the colourful fish, there's a variety of soft and hard corals. And just as I'm thinking, this is such a peaceful experience, drifting along in the current, observing the sea life of the outback coast. Along comes a shark. Time for me to get out of the water. Well, we might have been exploring the outback coast and its natural wonders, but it's not like the outback I know. But I'm not complaining. This is just wonderful, and it's a great place to end our journey. It's taken us 19 days. We've travelled 4,495 kilometres. And that's not too far when you consider the size of Western Australia. And we've used 795 litres of diesel. But it's been well worth it. The outback coast has some stunning natural wonders. And by the way, don't forget to join us next time we travel all over the countryside. <laughs>